What is the IMT? Well, it's a revolutionary international organization for the overthrow of capitalism. We're very modest. We only want to overthrow capitalism on one planet. The others we will see later. Um, now, I became a full-timer 40 years ago, this month I think it was, and I joined the organization nearly 50 years ago, that's next year. What did I join? Well, it was explained to me. At the time, we were uh, the militant tendency and we were doing entryism in the Labour Party. Now, in spite of that, there are groups out there that try and use that to say, oh, you were, well, we had it yesterday, uh, Clause 4 Socialist Fabians. And I thought, if you're going to debate the ideas of an organization, debate what they actually stand for and have stood for for decades, not a falsification of what they stand for. We've always stood for the revolutionary transformation of society and for the abolition of capitalism on a global scale. Now, when I joined, what did we have in terms of the forces? Well, we had about 600 comrades in Britain. To you, it sounds great, isn't it, to, to have what we have now? And it's taken bloody decades to rebuild it um, after what happened in the, um, in the 90s. But I'll, I might touch on that later on. We had about 600 comrades in Britain. What was the rest of the international? Uh, three comrades in Germany. Three in Belgium, I think we had. I think we had about seven in Sweden. And 15, I think, in Ireland. That was the international. So uh, we've come a little way since then. Now, but we had something else, not just, not just those small numbers. We had ideas and we had a method of building the organization. With ideas and method, you can build. Now, um, we base ourselves obviously on a sound theoretical foundation, and I will go into some of that in a minute. But um, I've been asked uh, in the past, what keeps you going, you know, being around for a while? And I always try and think, and there's two things that keep you going. Lenin referred to this. You can't be a communist without an element of hatred. Now, it, what I mean hatred is not your neighbor, it's class hatred, a hatred of the people at the top. Um, and I have always detested the rich and powerful from, a very young, from when I was a very young man, growing up in a working class family with a dad who was a steel worker, who worked very, very hard. You come from a working class family and you see what capitalism does to workers, destroys them physically. Um, so you have that in you, and a lot of you probably came towards communism, Marxism, with that feeling inside you of hatred of what they're doing. Look at the, just look at Gaza. How can you not sit every day and watch those scenes? And I think, think, I'm a Marxist, I should be calmer. But I feel like smashing, not just smashing the TV, I really, you think, you just feel like taking up guns and going somewhere and doing something. How can that be happening? But because you're a Marxist, you also remember that you can't actually do that. What do you do? Build the organization that can overthrow the system which produces that barbarism. Calmly stick to your job and carry on building the organization. Hatred, of course, is one element. Without it, I can't imagine being a communist. But that's not enough. You see, you can hate, but you can get active, and you can get active in the wrong ideas, the wrong methods, waste your energy and time, and come out of it demoralized. And then you become the parents that Alan was referring to yesterday and say to the next generation, don't bother, I've done it, I've been there. Uh, you can't do anything. The problem was... They had the wrong ideas. I saw more than one generation destroyed since I've been in the organization because of the mistakes of the movement, the mistakes of the organizations they joined, and the wrong conclusions that they drew from that. We have 
the fortune of having ideas. The theoretical understanding of this organization is above any other. And, that's, and we're not doing it, we're not boasting it. It's not a question of just boasting about how clever we are. I think we've shown it over the decades to have had a correct approach and a correct idea. We understand how capitalism works. We have a philosophical outlook which gives us an understanding of society in general. And you see, that comes from a previous generation. It comes from Marx and Engels. It comes from Lenin and Trotsky. It comes from Ted Grant and others who have built in the past, um, which gives us an understanding of history, of where we come from, where this society has come from, and where it is going. Um, in essence, another answer you could give to what is, what are we? We are the memory of the working class. Why do we study history? Why do we have other sessions? Like earlier on, we were discussing China uh, in, in the session before this, um, or, or other situations. It's to understand the past in order not to make the same mistakes that were made in the past. And it's, we are the memory. We remember the past and we bring that memory back to the working class of today. Without an organization like this, the working class would enter struggle without the memories of the past or with a partial memory, a partial understanding. That's the main role of this organization. And because capitalism is a global system, the class struggle is a global struggle and it's a struggle for socialism on a global scale. We discussed, we have discussed many times the Russian revolution the degeneration of that revolution and the emergence of the monstrous Stalinist regime, which for decades was presented as genuine communism. Whole generations have entered the struggle with illusions in that. Earlier on, we had a big picture of Stalin with his big mustache. In Italy, for decades, there was a saying, it's a, bit, it's a sort of Neapolitan Italian, Adamani Bafoon. It means Bafone. Bafone is the big mustache guy, the guy with the big mustache, he's got to come, i.e. all the solutions would come by Stalin saving the world. Of course, the ideas that he presented and the Stalinists presented were ideas in the post-war period of class compromise, of popular frontism and betrayal. Um, and people who went through that did draw the conclusions that the class struggle wasn't possible. Socialism in one country emerged, national roads to socialism. We have to ask ourselves the question, why then did Lenin pay so much attention to the building of the communist international? Why was it so important to him if the roads to socialism are national roads? Lenin had never envisaged that idea. That was an idea that was presented by the Stalinists. Lenin understood that communism in Russia would succeed on the back of a world revolution. Without that, it would be crushed. Now, coming back to the IMT, for those of you that don't know the details, I can't go into the details of the actual membership and sections, etc. Yesterday, last night, you saw several comrades from different countries speaking. We have about 40 sections and groups, plus... Um, uh, sympathizing groups and individuals working towards building groups in another 20 or so countries. It's over 60 countries that we are, uh, we have some kind of presence um, as an organization from the United States to Brazil, from Britain to Russia, to Spain, to Italy, Pakistan, Indonesia, South Africa, and many, many others. We are sections of one organization. We've had discussions here about what do we do to avoid degeneration of a revolution? One com young comrade asked the question in another session, um, how do we detect bureaucratic tendencies? And I was thinking, are you, th are you thinking of a kind of, you know, you know in your house when you have that detector for gas leaks, you have a machine and you just put it in the organization's headquarters and it detects bureaucratic tendencies. And if there are any, you, you, you stamp them out. That's not how it works. 
you have to have the material conditions for the success of socialism. And that means it has to be international. You can have brilliant minds. If you don't succeed in more than one country, you will degenerate bureaucratically, however morally superior you may be as individuals. Trotsky was brilliant. He could not stop the, the, the degeneration because it was a powerful material force. That's why we're building an international organization and we'll continue to do so. Our roots go back a long way. There's a, there's a, a long direct line that goes all the way back to Marx and Engels. They were the founding fathers of our organization, and we base ourselves on their ideas. Um, the Marx and Engels started off as two individuals. You know, they wrote the German ideology and never published it. They said afterwards it was more or less a self-clarification. By writing the, 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 the book, they drew the, the conclusions of what ideas were needed and what kind of organization, and they set about building it. And they built, the, 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 they transformed the, com the, the, they joined an organization that became the Communist League, then an international movement, and then the first international. I haven't got time here. I've, there's actually a video on the website. I give, I'm giving a talk on the first international, if you look it up, um, which, which explains that. That was dissolved um, after the uh, Paris Commune. Um, the second international emerged based on the ideas of Marx and Engels. Engels were, Engels were still alive when that was formed. The Second International succumbed to the pressures of capitalism and moved in the direction of reformism. Um, again, I don't have time to go into the details of that. Um, there's plenty of text to go into it. But it was within the Second International that a left wing emerged on the basis of the class struggle. Within it, you had figures like Lenin, like Trotsky, like Rosa Luxemburg and Liebknecht in Germany, who fought against that degeneration. And on the back of the revolutionary movement of 1918 onwards, the huge wave of class struggle, revolution after revolution, you had the emergence of a left wing, which eventually became the Communist International, with splits in many different countries. In Italy, in 1920, January 21, the Socialist Party split. The left wing moved and founded the Communist Party. In 1920, in France, at the Congress of Tours, the Socialist Party became the Communist Party. In Britain, a, a number of smaller groups came together and founded the Communist Party in Britain. And that's how the Third International um, came about. Now, um, we've had other discussions. Again, I don't want, I can't go into the details here. This is not the place to discuss the Stalinist degeneration of the Soviet Union, which determined the Stalinist degeneration of the Communist International, abandoning the ideas of Lenin, abandoning the ideas of world revolution, and going down the road of the national roads um, to socialism. The Stalinist regime in Russia, emerged as a monstrous uh, regime. It was a dictatorial regime which eliminated the Bolsheviks, the genuine Bolsheviks. Most of the Bolsheviks ended up in the gulags, in the camps. Um, very few survived um, that uh, period. Um, even the, if you look at the leadership, tiny number survived. Accused of counter-revolution, Zinoviev, Kamenev, Bukharin, Many others, Trotsky finally assassinated. That was a counter-revolution uh, led by the bureaucracy to destroy the genuine ideas of Bolshevism. But within that process, another opposition emerged, which became known first as the left opposition, and then the Fourth International, led by Leon Trotsky. The great role of Leon Trotsky was to save the ideas. Trotsky always explained, without him, the Russian Revolution would have been led by Lenin. It fell to him in the late 20s and the 30s to actually preserve the genuine ideas of Marxism, of Bolshevism, and to build at least small nuclei of supporters who um, defended those ideas. That is how the Fourth International emerged in 1938. 
founded um, by Trotsky and his supporters. Now, we claim the ideas of Marx and Engels, they're part of the IMT. We claim the first four congresses of the Communist International. They're our congresses. And we claim the Congress, the founding Congress of the Fourth International in 1938. Now, the, um, what happens subsequently, the Second World War um, is a, a, a testing moment for Trotskyists. Uh, they were very small. I worked out the figures looking at them. I think at the height, they had about 5,000 members internationally. We can finally say that we're stronger than the left opposition. I know that because I sat down the other day and I worked it out by adding up the numbers. Um, we will get a more, a more updated figure soon. But um, it was in the Second World War that we see the tendency which was to become the nucleus that would form our tendency. The British section of the Fourth International, um, I, again, I can't go into the details, the maneuvers of Cannon and the Americans, it's, it's too much stuff to go into here. But let's put it this way. The Fourth International was preparing for a wave of revolutions after the Second World War, similar to what was seen at the end of the First. It was a reasonable hypothesis to have, and it was proven, in fact, to, to, to be a concrete perspective. Think about it. In Italy, the Communist Party of Italy, which in 1935 had 2,000 members, half of them in prison, others in exile, by 1945 had close to 2 million members. The CGIL, the union which had been crushed by fascism, emerges in 1945 with 5 million members. Massive strike waves, 300,000 armed partisans fighting the Nazis, the resistance in France, the civil war in Greece. These were revolutionary events at the end of the Second World War. If we go beyond Europe, the Chinese Revolution, the massive movement in India for independence and the colonial revolution which swept the world. The Second World War was followed by a wave of revolution. But the Fourth International was a tiny organization. It was far too small to take advantage of that. The brief period of opportunity ended round about 1946-47, you could say. You could say it was like it was like 1943 to 48. There was a process which started with revolution, the end of the war, and then defeats. In Italy and France, the communist parties joined governments with the bourgeois and held the movement back. Um, I spoke to some old communists in Rome in the 80s who proudly told me they belonged to a movement called the communist movement, which was a rank and file movement in Rome, which emerged um, out of the control of the party bureaucracy, the party took some time to get back control of them. They were spontaneously rebuilding the Communist Party um, as, as fascism collapsed. And they were armed. They were partisans. They were fighting for communism. But that battle um, was lost. The political conditions which emerged were a defeat of the working class in one country after another, and then the beginning of the post-war boom. The, the, the conditions changed radically. The revolutionary potential had been wasted in the mid-40s, and you now had the beginning of a restabilization of the capitalist system. Now, during the Second World War, we have Ted Grant's group, which started off being called the Workers' International League, which was set up in 1938. They started off with six comrades, I think in Paddington, I think it was, and then it grew to about 30. But in the process of the Second World War, they built an organization that got to about 500, about 20,000 papers sold. And in 1944, they, they, they fused with another small group and they called themselves the Revolutionary Communist Party. That was the name of our organization at the end of the Second World War. And the message were clear, we're communists, but we're revolutionary communists. It was a message to the most advanced workers. But what happened 
um, is the end of that period, the boom that began, and here is where the Fourth International completely collapses. Um, because they had no understanding of what was happening. They continued to argue that revolution was round the corner when actually the revolution was behind you. It had already passed and had been lost. And just to give you an example, this is Ted Grant in 1946 in a document called Economic Perspectives. Um, he said, he wrote this, all the factors on a European and world scale indicate that the economic activity in Western Europe in the next period is not one of stagnation and slump, but one of revival and boom. Now, with hindsight, we can all say, well, yeah, that's what happened, isn't it? That's not what the leaders of the Fourth International were saying. Um, Ted, to continue, he said, um, the classic conditions for boom are present in Europe today. He went on, a new recovery can only prepare the way, however, for an even greater slump, an economic crisis than in the past, in the future. So the leaders of the British section were analyzing soberly the objective situation. If you don't do that as a Marxist leadership, you can destroy a whole organization. And that's what the Fourth International did. I will now quote to you, not from 1946, but 1951 where you would have thought that it was bleeding obvious that there was a boom. Excuse my French, as they say. Here I have a document published in a magazine called The Fourth International, which was a publication of the Americans, American section, November, December 1951. Now, I don't know if you can see it, but it says, Survey and Analysis of the Final Crisis of World Capitalism. This is 1951. This is in, right at the beginning of the most powerful boom you've ever seen in the history of capitalism. And they're declaring that it's the final crisis. It wasn't just that they declared the final crisis. Um, I will show you um, James Cannon. James Cannon, who was a major leader of the Fourth International. Um, in 1951, he talked about all out prepar preparations for a third world war. This was the perspective of the so-called leaders of the Fourth International. Pierre Frank, another leader said, he talked about the coming war. The preparations for the third world war have taken on an intensive character. 1951. Um, you laugh, but it's tragic because you tell the members of an organization these things, you take the workers who were members of the Revolutionary Communist Party. I can't go into the details, the maneuvers and how they, they, they actually expelled Ted finally in 1950. The Fourth International expelled him, which showed what a bureaucratic organization it had become. They couldn't tolerate the criticisms of Ted. Why? Because he kept getting it right and they kept getting it wrong. Prestige politics was more important to them than understanding the real situation. Um, Ted... Um, later on in an article called The Origins of the Collapse of the Fourth International, um, he talks about um, the capitalists have been unable to find a way out of the collapse and decline of economy. This has prepared the way in Western Europe for a steady and fairly rapid recovery. And this is what he said about the Fourth International. This, this is back in 1946. The Fourth International will only discredit itself if it refuses to recognize the inevitable recovery and it will disorientate its own cadres. That's what they did. My dad emigrated to this country in 1952. He told me what it was like. There was no unemployment. They were demanding, they were going. Talk about immigration. He, he applied for a job in Italy. He got, he got checked by a doctor to see if he was... Um, um, in the right conditions for what they needed, i.e. if he was strong and sturdy, he can do this, the work of a steel worker. But he said there was no unemployment. No unemployment. The leaders of the Fourth International are telling the workers Cap capitalism is facing a, a major crisis and revolution. You tell that to workers in a factory. 
who are being asked to do overtime, overtime, and they're sucking in immigrants from other countries. It was a completely false perspective. What it showed was they had not absorbed the method of Trotsky. They treated Trotsky like a Bible. You quote, Trotsky said, you still have groups today who argue that you, the capitalism cannot develop the productive forces beyond the level of 1938. When I was a young comrade, I used to think, why 1938? Why 1938? Oh, finally got it. Trotsky says in the, fourth, in the transitional program, the productive forces are stagnating. Well, if Trotsky said in 1938 that the productive forces are stagnating in 1976 and 1990 and 1999 and 2010, just like Jesus said in the Bible, and because Trotsky said it in 1938, they can't be developing. They can't be developing. We have the biggest working class we've ever seen in the history of capitalism, 750 million industrial workers are in the planet. A powerful force has been created. But for these people, all you got to do is repeat the words of Trotsky in 1938 and repeat them out of context and without understanding them and without understanding the method. Trotsky would not have continued to make these mistakes. I'm sure he would not have. He would have soberly analyzed the, the, the changes in the objective situation and prepared the cadres for that. In a situation like that, even more important that you have correct ideas and methods. Marxists will smash their organization if they get perspective analysis wrong. That's why we pay so much attention to theory. Now, um, the, just, just, just to go back to Cannon. This is November 1945. And I will quote Cannon. Trotsky predicted that the fate of the Soviet Union would be decided in the war. That remains our firm conviction. Only we disagree with some people who carelessly think the war is over. <laughs> you laugh. He says it's written down. The war has only passed through one stage and is now in the process of regroupment and reorganization for the second. The war is not over. And the revolution which we said would issue from the war in Europe is not taken off the agenda. You see, they had said the war would produce revolution. Well, there's no revolution. Scratch, scratch, scratch. <laughs> like an equation, you know, you take, hey, equal, you take this away from this and that. Ah, there's no revolution on this side of the equation. Ah, that means the war can't have finished. That is literally how they thought, which shows you that they had completely abandoned the method if they'd ever understood it. That was the problem with these people. They had not understood the method uh, of Marxism. They had not understood the method of Trotsky. And then they went on to make mistake after mistake. Um, we had a discussion on, on uh, China and Maoism before. First, they said Mao could not take power and would betray. When he did take power, suddenly they discovered that he was an unconscious Trotskyist. Um, Ted, you read Ted, um, explains um, that what was coming to power in China, first of all, he predicted they would come to power because it was evident from, from the facts. But once in power, he said it's, it's basically a Stalinist regime with a bureaucracy. And the masses of China will need to carry out a second political revolution to move towards genuine communism, i.e. remove the bureaucracy. Um, the, um, there's, a, there's a document called The Reply to David James, Spring 1949 by Ted Grant. Um, he says this, while a genuine revolutionary Trotskyist leadership in a backward country would draw its strength from the proletariat, welding the peasant masses behind it, Mao rests on the peasantry and not only bases himself on the passivity of the proletariat at this stage, but ruthlessly suppresses the proletarians who dare take measures against the bourgeoisie on the basis of independent class action. At a later stage, Mao will lean on the proletariat when he needs it against the bourgeoisie, only later to betray and ruthlessly suppress it. This is 
the Marxist approach to that phenomenon while it's happening, not 20 years later. It's very good to have the, 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 the you know, hindsight. Um, and I mean, I can't, I can't go into all the details. They, they did it again with Tito in, in Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia first was a capitalist country, then suddenly it became a relatively healthy um, um, worker state. Um, and again, um, in spring 1949, um, on the question of what would happen between China and Russia, he says, um, he actually predicted the senior Soviet split, but now I have to rush because I've just been told I've got le less, a lot less time um, on my hands. Now, Ted maintained the ideas, as I've shown here. Was expelled in 1950, was left with about 30 comrades. Can you imagine, you think we're still, we're small today. Imagine being an organization with 30 members in one country, in at the beginning of the most powerful boom in history, really isolated from the working class, struggling against the stream. Ted Grant and his small group kept going, producing documents, analysis, etc., and had a perspective that capitalism is booming, but like all booms, it will come to an end. And when it comes to an end, there will be a new wave of class struggle. And when that wave of class struggle comes, there will be political changes and a radicalization of the working class. That is what happened in the 70s, comrades. It took about 20 years, 20, 25 years. They launched the militant in 1964, orientated to the Labour Party, and built a tendency embedded in the Labour Party, in the, in the youth of the Labour Party, and built up a strong tendency. That's what I joined. Bought a paper on the street, and that was the end of it. Um, my life changed ever since. Um, I don't regret one second doing that. But lots of people were recruited in the 70s on the basis of that period. The perspectives were confirmed, and there was a huge influx of workers and youth into the mass organizations. The trade unions were doubling their members. The workers' parties were growing everywhere. And with it, left-wing currents were emerging in many different countries. <clears throat> On the back of this process, we started to build an international in the 1970s, which was launched in, launched in 1974 with the members which I listed earlier on. But very quickly, we started to grow. I remember Alan Woods went to Spain. When I joined, Alan was on his way to Franco, Spain. I was reading the internal bulletins. Not like you guys, you get it every bloody week on an email. <laughs> this came out every three, six months, and it was a printed thing. Um, but it was reports about how we were developing the work in Spain, in the underground, under Franco. We're making contacts in Sri Lanka, making contacts in many other countries. I remember, you think, what, what have you got to do if you're a Marxist? You go and build where it's necessary. I joined the organization. We had nothing in Italy. I could speak Italian. My job is to build in Italy. I went to Italy in 1977, and we started to build um, with very small forces. Can you imagine selling the paper on a demonstration? And you are literally the only one selling the paper. And they say to you, I've already got it. And I say, can't be. And, and they say, well, are you the only one? Oh, sorry, yeah, you obviously bought it off the other comrades. Um, couldn't admit to be on, on your own. Lots of comrades did that, went to different countries, recruited in Britain, and started to build the international. Now, um, that international grew through the 70s and the 80s. Um, but again, <clears throat> history tends to repeat itself, not exactly the same way. But you see, the wave of class struggle of the 70s really started to peter out by the end of the 70s and early 80s. By the time you get to the middle of the 80s, the miners' strike in Britain, for instance, was like a big last gasp of the class struggle. Incredible strike of insurrectionary uh, um, proportions, battles with the police, a year-long strike. A huge battle took place. And the Tories invested massively in that. How did they invest? Billions in policing and preparing the ground to defeat the miners. Defeat the miners, and you send a message to the rest of the working class that the class struggle is finished and cannot be, um, cannot be successful. It wasn't just the miners. The Fiat workers in Italy in 1980 were defeated after a long strike. 
the, uh, the PATCO union in the States, Reagan smashed the Air Controllers Union. This was being repeated in country after country after country. The class, that, that wave of class struggle came to an end, in effect, by the mid 80s. The objective situation started to change. A shift to the right took place in several countries. The rise of the Tories in this country, Thatcherism dominated. It was a general, <clears throat> I mean, I'm, I'm very, I'm simplifying, obviously, it wasn't like this in, in every single country exactly the same time. But in this period of a decade or so, you had a fall in union membership, a fall in strikes. You look at the statistics. In Italy, the strikes from a huge level of 69, 70, 72, they collapsed to historical lows. Britain, 72, on the verge of a general strike, massive strike wave. My dad, he was in a strike, seven weeks strike. It was normal in those days to have your dad, your parents doing that, coming home and getting a daily strike report from your dad who'd been on the picket line. This was what was happening. That was transformed into its opposite. And by the end of the 80s, things had radically changed. This was combined with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, <clears throat> this all had an, a, a, an effect on consciousness. The idea that communism has failed. Of course, we know what had actually failed. But in the minds of millions of people, it was communism that had failed. Socialism wasn't possible. The class struggle has failed. We've tried and tried and tried, and, and we've achieved nothing. The Labour Party shifts to the right. The left is emptied out. The unions start to go down. Again, a change in the objective situation. It was necessary to understand that. Unfortunately, the international, the majority leadership of the militant drew the conclusion that it was up, up and away. The red 90s, we've rented the red 90s, etc. When actually in reality, the objective situation had changed in a negative sense. I can remember in the middle of that split, we had the Italian section having their conference with a couple of British comrades coming to speak. And some of the young comrades said to me, Fred, are these full timers of the international? I said, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, they, they're on an incredibly low level um, and disorientated the organization. But more importantly, the political level of the organization was going down. Less attention was being paid to that. It was all action and campaigning. There was a battle to be had in 1991, uh, 92, in that organization. And we had that battle. Again, I can't go into the details. There is an article called How the Militant Was Built and How It Was Destroyed by Rob Sewell. I think it's on the, the website. You can, you can um, go and read it and study it um, to get a, a much, a much um, clearer uh, picture of that. But just to give you an idea, in 1970, we published a document called Program of the International, written by Ted. It's on the website. This is the theoretical basis upon which that international had been created. And then, of course, um, was partially um, destroyed by the, um, the antics of the majority of, of, of the militant at the time. We came out of that split with a, sm a much smaller organization. I think, on memory, we had comrades in about 12 countries. Um, several sections came wholly uh, on the side of Alan and Ted in that faction fight. Others split. The Italian section, to my personal pleasure, came 100% with Ted. We didn't give the Taffites one toehold. And to this day, they have hardly anything, which is still something I when I'm sitting at home having a little, my port or my wine, I enjoy thinking about and enjoying it. Now, we, we, we can't be too sectarian here, but um, I am pleased. Um, we went through that battle, um, and some people think it was about the Labour Party. In actual fact, that wasn't the key element. They, they still think that's what it was about. That's why they can't understand what we're doing. It was an element. We had built up a strong position in the Labour Party, and we could have held on to some of those positions. But nobody disagreed with the idea the Labour Party had moved to the right, and we needed to do more open work, more open youth work, etc. But it was the theoretical um, uh, education which was being abandoned. For instance, the militant closed the education department at one stage. They didn't consider it an important department. 
we think it was a key department. That's an indication of where they were going. And it's reflected to this day in the difference between us and the Socialist Party. But we turned towards rebuilding the organization after 1991-92. And we thought we'd, we'd base ourselves on our strong points, the theoretical strength of the organization. That's why, for instance, we published a book called Reason and Revolt. Now, you might think, what's the point of writing a book about science and Marxism? Well, I'm telling you, at that time, it played a huge role internally in the organization because it showed the comrades that we have ideas. Not, it's not just about wages and conditions. It's not just about a 35-hour week or whatever. Marxism has a lot to say about everything. We do. We can talk about anything. Science, history, whatever. And this showed how 100 years of scientific discoveries had confirmed the philosophy of Marxism, dialectical materialism. You lose grasp of dialectical materialism as a method. You are lost as an organization. Trotsky explained that many times um, to the leadership of the American section. He didn't quite grasp it. You must study dialectical materialism. Study historical materialism. You've got to have an understanding of Marxist philosophy if you're going to build a powerful communist organization, which we did. And then we started gradually to recover. We started to rebuild. Um, we had lost most of what we had in the Americas. But you see how you can build with ideas and method. I remember in 1998, a young lad in his 20s called John Peterson in London came across us. He was very interested in that in reason and revolt, which shows you you can build with those ideas. We won him to the organization, one comrade went back to the States. Can you imagine? One in the United States. By then, of course, the internet was starting to come on board, making it a little bit easier. You got it easy, you guys. Not like when I was building. <laughs> you actually had to literally print the paper and sell it. Um, the um, went back, gradually started building up the first nucleus. Five, ten people, twenty people. The same happened in Canada. One British comrade um, and in other sections, too. And then we started making contacts with groups. Like in Switzerland, we met a group, an organized group, with a few funny ideas um, to begin with. Um, but we sorted, the, we, we sorted them out, you know, the good ones from the, those that are not so good. Um, gradually um, making contacts, building up the organization. With these ideas and methods, from one in America, we've gone to over 600. In Canada, you heard the report, we're going towards the 700. We are building in section after section. In Italy, they're going to have a seminar on Lenin in the middle of December to prepare next year. They're going to celebrate, I'm sure they're going to celebrate the 500 at that seminar. The French are growing. Everywhere, um, the organization is now growing, but it, it took those decades of preparation which combined theoretical um, preparation, the documents, the articles, you read the material, there's a wealth of material and books out there that we've educated the comrades on, plus the method of building. We have had many different ways of working and we're very flexible. Um, we've had entryism, full on entryism like in the Labour Party, we've dominated the Labour Party Young Socialists. We even had MPs, Labour MPs, that we did, having done the work of the Revolutionary Communist Party during the Second World War, when it was necessary to have a much more open approach, an independent approach. Then we had a period of where we were orientating to the mass organizations, but orientating, not doing much there because there wasn't much to be done. And we did our own independent youth work. That's the period of the Marxist societies, which paid off really well, really successful work. Now we've reached a point where if you have to take it to a higher level, now we are in a situation very similar. No, it's not exactly the same. Similar to what Ted Grant faced in the Second World War with an open revolutionary communist identity. That's why the Brazilian comrades are now calling themselves the Internationalist Communist Organization. We'll see what others do. 
I have some, <laughs> I have some ideas, but we will discuss them in the coming period. This is a brief 40 minute history of this organization. There's a lot you could read and develop more on, but this is fundamentally what the IMT is. And to go back to what I said at the beginning, we have sections in many countries. We have started to develop in Chile. In, uh, it, we've got an organization in Mexico, in Colombia, um, South Africa, we developed recently. Um, Sri Lanka, we have contacts. We, we are really spreading globally as a tendency. Um, and our task is to rebuild Lenin's Communist International. What it will be called, we will see, but that is the model upon which we must base ourselves and work towards building big forces in country after country. That is the answer to the question, how do you avoid degeneration and bureaucracy? You don't limit yourself to a national outlook. You have an internationalist approach. You fight for communism in every country on a global scale. That will finally achieve the final victory of communism on this planet and will transform it and prepare the future of humanity. Not to do that, you know what the alternative is. Just look at Gaza when you talk about barbarism, bombing hospitals, killing thousands of children and justifying it. Today, they're remembering, as Alan said, is it today or tomorrow? Today, they're remembering the dead of previous wars, i.e. they're remembering the young men that they sent to be butchered to defend their system while they justify wars today, which are still defending their system. This is the barbarism that this system creates. It doesn't have to be like that, but it depends on you, comrades. Woo!